every time we fly, there's one danger no one can fully predict. Mayday, mayday, mayday. It's that initial reaction where you're like, oh my gosh, are we going to have to eject? When planes and birds collide, the results can be catastrophic. In 2009, a miracle on New York's Hudson River seizes the world's attention. Behind the scenes, an extraordinary team pieces together what happened. How could birds bring down a huge jet like this? This is the inside story of the quest to solve the miracle on the Hudson. Well, I happened to look up, and it was like, there was the feather. Now, as our skies get busier, an army of experts are racing to solve the bird strike problem. We are going to learn how to unzip birds. Before disaster strikes. We really have to plan for the worst case scenario because we may not be so lucky the next time. Eagle Flight 4718, contact part 2124.75. January 15, 2009, 3.25 p.m. U.S. Airways Flight 1549 is 95 seconds into its journey from New York's LaGuardia Airport to Charlotte, North Carolina. Very briefly, out of the corner of my eye, I, I caught a movement as I glanced left, and you could see a blob fly by the window. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539. Hit birds through lost thrust and fell pitch. It's returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left, heading up uh, 220. I realized by the dead silence we had no engine power. Cactus 1529, turn right 280. You can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. Captain Sullenberger came across the, the loudspeaker and said, brace for impact. All you could hear from where we were sitting was the computerized voice from the cockpit going, pull up, pull up. Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. It's automated. And I just thought, OK. Within minutes, worrying news reaches Washington, DC. I realized that something big had happened uh, in New York with an airplane and possibly a bird. And all of us got the chills. I just knew that when I got home and turned on the TV that there were going to be fatalities. CCTV captures the moment the plane hits the Hudson at 140 miles per hour. Incredibly, all 155 passengers and crew survive the landing. And within 40 minutes, they're all safely on dry land. Miraculously, tragedy has been avoided. And an investigation is launched immediately. The world was waiting. A lot of people have never heard of bird strikes before this. They were wondering how could birds bring down a huge jet like this. For as long as man has been flying, we've been sharing the skies with birds, sometimes with tragic consequences. A grim search in the shallows of Boston's Pleasant Park Channel near Logan International Airport. This is the worst bird strike to date. In October 1960, 62 people lose their lives when their plane hits a flock of thousands of starlings. Since then, the number of flights globally has risen a hundredfold to over 100,000 every day. With the skies busier than ever, more and more planes are coming into contact with birds. And the results can be terrifying. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Something that's 253 Hotel. Check the base here, we're not 
Every year, bird strikes cost the aviation industry billions of dollars. And since 1988, over 280 people have lost their lives. As flight numbers continue to rise, scientists around the world are searching for ways to avert potential catastrophe for planes and birds alike. But with thousands of species of birds in the sky, it's a complex and constantly shifting problem. There's forces of nature that are larger than us. Wildlife are just dynamic. There's a lot of variables at play here. Every environment's different, every habitat's different, birds behave differently in different parts of the country. The species on one airfield may not be what's the problem on another airfield. And it's not just birds that come in all shapes and sizes. It depends on the aircraft type, the amount of damage that a bird can do. Getting to grips with the problem takes an extraordinary level of expertise and a very unique resource. This is a specimen of a Caroline parakeet. This bird was collected in 1879. Located in the National Museum of Natural History, this is one of the largest collections of birds in the world, containing over 620,000 specimens. This is a bird that was collected by Teddy Roosevelt. This is his label from the Roosevelt Museum. Founded by people who could not have imagined the jet age, the collection now has a surprising new role. Today we use it in our work for bird strike identification but these collections have been around for 150 years, so that was before aircraft were, were even invented. These specimens are central to the work of the Smithsonian Feather Identification Laboratory. Can you hand me that Trey Kestrel's gem? Where a team of forensic ornithologists play a crucial role in understanding the bird strike problem, identifying which species of birds are involved. Once you know what the species is, then you know why it wants to be on your airfield. What does it eat? What does it drink? Why does it want to live in this sort of habitat? Once you know that, then you can go into the airfield and mitigate the problem so that the birds are not attracted to that environment. The laboratory is investigating more cases than ever before. They can receive over 100 bags of bird remains in a day. This one's another good whole feather. Oh, yeah. Kind of peachy. But after a collision with a plane, there's often little left of the bird. Sometimes it's feathers, and other times a mix of tissues, blood, and feather fragments, known as snarge. This one's the Air Force, a one? couple samples. Okay. We got one for whole feather, as so. well as we got some good snarge in there. In January 2009, Carla's team faced their most high-profile challenge to date, working out what species of bird caused the event now known as the Miracle on the Hudson. But with cold weather hampering attempts to lift the plane from the river, would the team get hold of the vital evidence before it was too late? The worries were, of course, you know, the engines have been underwater. Um, it's freezing cold there. Was it indeed a bird? Would there be any evidence left in the engine? Would it be degraded? Would there be feathers at all? So we were sort of worried about what kind of evidence we were going to receive and if it was going to be enough to get us to that species level. Huge cranes are maneuvered into position next to the submerged plane, ready for the lengthy task of hoisting the fuselage and retrieving the black boxes. Finally, two days after the incident, the plane was lifted onto a barge. And soon after, investigators began the search for traces of bird. The place stank of jet fuel. 
It was slippery and dangerous, and it was freezing. We all had to wear life jackets on top of our winter clothing and hard hats. I was on my back, crawling under the wing. I remember very clearly, all of a sudden, I, I happened to look up, and it was like, there was the feather. It looked like a feather out of a pillow. It was snow white, like somebody had just stuck it to the bottom of the wing. And I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, I've got a feather. With thousands of flights still passing through New York's airspace every day, the pressure was on Carla Dove and her team to determine exactly what happened to flight US 1549. So here it is. This is the evidence that we have archived for Flight 1549. Um, this case was a little bit different because we received about 69 different samples. Typically, in a case, we'll get a bag of remains or maybe two bags. The bags come labeled, um, usually with the engine number. So this material came out of the engine. Um, this is the date that it was collected. The most crucial piece of evidence, and the team's starting point, was the feather found by Michael Beeger. We had this nice, whitish sort of brown feather. And it has all of the important parts, which was really uh, exciting to us, because the fluffy part of the feather is where we actually find the microscopic characters that are unique to groups of birds. Identifying the species from a feather is no easy task. 550 species have been involved in bird strikes to date, and each individual bird has a huge variety of feathers that change with age and the time of year. Fortunately, in this case, the team had a key clue, eyewitness testimony. Initially, we received reports from Captain Sullivan that he had hit geese. And so people will say, well, why do you have to continue the investigation? He already knew he hit geese. But you have to remember that sometimes pilots are like fishermen. And if they you know, really catch a fish this, this big, it, it actually comes out to be this big when they describe it to you. So we really wanted to confirm that. Narrowing down the possible culprits involved a technique pioneered in this lab and until recently practiced nowhere else in the world microscopic identification of feather barbules. So the first thing we'll do is take a little piece of the fluffy down. And the down on a feather actually has some different physical characters. And it's really good to get us to the group of bird. Oh, yeah, this is beautiful. And already, I've got the characters that I'm really excited that uh, are probably going to confirm Goose. The only way for Marcy to confirm her suspicions is to compare the unknown feather to a reference sample of a goose. We're seeing almost identical characters. These beautiful triangular nodes that are kind of out at the tips of these really long feather barbules. Also, the distance between the nodes. From our standpoint, that's a long distance, which is also very particular, which is kind of exciting, of geese. The microscopic evidence has led to the family of birds, but it also provides another clue. It's showing some very subtle stippling pigment. It's a little hard, looks like little tiny dots that we see in the Branta genus. The team were now looking for a goose of the Branta genus. But in the New York area, this means one of two possible culprits, the Canada goose and the Brant. Determining which one had brought down flight US 1549 was crucial. The Brant goose, that bird weighs about three pounds. Um, the Canada goose weighs about eight pounds, 10 pounds. So knowing the weight of the birds that went into the engine was very important to the engineers because those engines on that aircraft were designed to take a four pound bird. So if it had been a brant, then the engine should have been able to continue to fly. 
The miracle on the Hudson led to a huge increase in bird strike reporting and to 400% more work for Carla's team. Today, they process 10,000 cases every year. And half of them don't come from commercial aviation, but from the US military. This is Joint Base San Antonio, Randolph, in Texas. I've flown numerous places around the world. Birds are sort of an issue, and we always think about them at any base. But I got to Randolph and immediately noticed, just flying around the pattern, that holy cow, there's a lot more birds here. That's sortie. We took off onto a low-level route, so we're flying along at about uh, 400 miles an hour, uh, about 500 feet above the ground. I was a pilot instructor, training instructor at that point. So the student, he's sitting in the back seat. He's talking about what we're expecting to see at our next uh, turn point. Should be seeing a set of towers are going, uh, I believe the northern one's in the valley. And then uh, there'll be a southern one on the hill with the airport you said is in there. Oh. All the right side, basically, of the canopy itself is gone. If you can imagine, you know, you roll your window down on the freeway at 60 miles an hour and you get all this wind noise. We're doing almost 400 miles an hour. The body of the bird ends up hitting the backseat of my student in the shoulder. Where you said is in the bird. Oh. It's that initial reaction where you're like, oh my gosh, are we gonna have to eject? That's kind of the big adrenaline rush. You have the aircraft. I immediately take the airplane from him. He was flying, and I start climbing away from the ground, because that's always what we do if there's any kind of problem on the, uh, the a low level, close to the ground. We get away from the ground, because that's our biggest threat. Bits of the plexiglass have ripped out a connection off my mask. Hey, radio Mach 11 flight exit, GR 140 at Echo. So I'm making all these radio calls. Nobody can hear me. And eventually, the backseater, the student, is going like, hey, can you hear me? And I'm able to very carefully Give him a thumbs up. I mean, I don't want to stick my arm up too high and you know have it hit in the 400 mile an hour, or 300 mile by this point mile an hour wind and ripped off, and, or you know dislocate my shoulder or something. So I'm like, yeah, okay, I can hear you. Okay, okay. I'm good. I'm good. I start dialing in our navigation aids to go into Kelly Air Force Base, or Kelly Field, uh, on the west side of San Antonio. We land. I taxi clear the runway, and we shut down there. Uh, and at that point, we're able to uh, unstrap and kind of take a look at the damage um, and stand up there. And there's just, you know, the bird blood and guts are all over the back cockpit. With the help of the Feather Lab, the bird was identified as a black vulture, which has a wingspan of nearly five feet. So as bad as this was, a bird that size could have done more damage. It's all a game of inches. It was probably the worst thing I've had happen in an airplane. The US military's bird strike program, known as BASH, is one of the best in the world. And it needs to be. Military flights represent just 6% of all flights in the US, but account for nearly a third of all reported bird strikes. Flying at low altitudes and high speeds puts military pilots on a collision course with birds. Typically, our commercial aircraft are in the bird environment during takeoff and landing. And once they get to altitude, the probability of a strike goes down remarkably. Not only is it where the birds live, it's also the speed of the aircraft on a low-level mission. We're flying 500 miles an hour, so now even a smaller bird that you hit will do serious damage. Joint Base San Antonio, Randolph, is located in the middle of the Central Flyway, a major migratory path that funnels millions of large birds, like vultures, into the area every winter. On the airfield itself, there's a year-round bird threat, one that requires extraordinary control measures. All right, 
and take weapons all safe, charge away. Every morning at dawn, a team is dispatched from the base safety office, armed with paintball guns. All right, I'll take the outer right corridor. I'll take the inner right. Let's branch off. Their mission, to remove a threat in the center of the base that could halt flying operations. And you see one running for his life now. Look, we got a couple here. This area yep. between the base's two runways is home to about 50,000 white-winged doves. We don't want to hit the birds, but we want to hit near enough to them that they know, don't stay in this tree. And sometimes they like to mess with us and just hop from tree to tree. I'm OK with that. The team's goal is to get as many of these white-winged doves off the base and away from the runways before flying operations start. We have a small flock right here coming over the runway right now. We have an active runway with T-38 trainers coming across. Most of these birds are gonna be anywhere from two, 300 feet up to maybe five, 600 feet up in the air, right at the same altitude as our planes are launching. To keep their pilots safe, the biologists on the ground have studied the behavior of these birds in detail. So they'll leave here and they'll come, they'll fly across and thousands of thousands of birds just come across, fly over this runway, head over and they eat, do what they do off base and later on during the day they'll trickle back. But the most critical point of, of, of the day is this time of day between 7 and 9 a.m. Armed with a detailed knowledge of the birds, the team have created a targeted program to keep them safely away from the jets. We got uh, screamers, we got some bangers. On that unit right there, we'll have what we call a distress caller, which, which emits distress calls of, of injured birds or a predatory bird. So it just makes that particular bird species not want to be here. These measures keep the birds from flying across the runways. It would only take one dove to cause engine failure in a T-38 jet. Right, as you can see down here in the engine, you have the first stage of blades. Those blades right there are not the only ones back there. You have about another 10 to 15, even 30 stages of blades spinning at high speed. Now, if one of those blades gets hit by a really small bird, it will let one of those blades go and liberate it from the rest of the engine and then cause it to go down the rest of the compressor stages. That's really bad. It's not just an airplane that's flying through. There's actual people that I work with on a regular basis here that are flying these planes. So it's my job to keep these birds out of their flight path. Since the early 1980s, the US military has been gathering data on every one of their bird strikes. In 1990, commercial aviation followed suit, launching an ambitious project, the National Wildlife Strike Database. Since then, more than 200,000 strikes have been reported. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. And the database provides us with a tremendous amount of information on the nature of the strikes that are occurring. The species of birds, the phase of flight, the type of aircraft, the type of damage that occurs to the various components, time of day, height above ground level, all of these things, when collected in aggregate and analyzed, give a very clear picture of what the problem is. This data has revealed the exact moment when planes are most vulnerable to a bird strike. Take off. This is when the aircraft is at maximum thrust maximum velocity and the impact forces are at their greatest. The aircraft is fully fueled, overweight for a return landing. All of these factors mean that it is much more likely that if you have a significant strike on takeoff, then you may result in a catastrophic outcome. But on January 15, 2009, the mystery of flight US 1549 was that it was safely through takeoff. They were flying almost at 3,000 feet at five miles out from the runway. I mean, this is the envelope where you're 
your chances of having a bird strike go down significantly. Through microscopic analysis, the team narrowed the search down to two types of geese. The lighter brant and the much heavier Canada goose. Determining which species brought down flight US 1549 was crucial. Here we have a museum study skin of a Canada goose. Comparing feathers to a specimen like this um, is very important because birds have tens of thousands of feathers on their body and there are a lot of variation in a single individual. You can see the neck feathers are black, you know, the breast feathers are sort of brown, there's white feathers on the under tail coverts and the, and the belly, and then there's solid black feathers on the upper tail, dark brown on the back. So there's a lot of variation even in one single individual bird. And so matching a feather to a bird is a quite complicated process and it really takes a lot of experience. In this case, the feather actually matched very, very well with this specimen of Canada goose. You can even see the lighter sort of buffy tip on this grayish brown feather. It's a pretty good match, but in a case like this, we're never sure until we complete the whole analysis using the other tools in our toolbox, which includes the DNA analysis. Within the 69 bags of evidence, the team found 18 samples that yielded viable DNA. They inputted the results into an online DNA database, and they matched 99 to 100% to one species. So Monday morning, you know, we all come running in. Did the sequences come off the plate? What's the answer? Uh, did we get this right? Uh, and then whenever it came back, Branicanadensis, which is Canada goose, and we were all like, yes. This is a key finding for engineers. Canada geese weigh an average of seven to 10 pounds, much heavier than the engines were certified to withstand. What's more, Canada geese fly in flocks. Designing engines that can survive an impact with multiple large birds is a near impossible challenge. The engineers tell me they could design one, but the plane probably wouldn't fly and it would be too heavy or inefficient, or it would have such poor fuel efficiency that no one would use it. So it's just a very difficult balancing act of designing engines that are fuel efficient and also able to withstand flocks of birds. But it's now more important than ever that engines can withstand a bird strike. As the jet age dawns, most large commercial aircraft have three or four engines. Today, 96% have just two. When you have an impact to an engine and you lose an engine, obviously you have four engines, you have three others that are still flying, working order. If you have two engines and you lose one, it's a little more difficult. And we know from USAIR 1549, if you lose two engines on a two-engine aircraft, you essentially become a glider. Since the 1960s, engines have been tested to prove their resilience to bird strikes. Exceptional durability was demonstrated by the ingestion of four two-and-a-half-pound birds at takeoff. Traditionally, this only happened once the engine had been built. But advanced computer modeling now allows engineers to test their engines much earlier. So this is a simulation of the bird hitting the fan blade. The purpose being to look at the amount of damage that occurs in the fan blade so that we can predict the state of the blade after the impact. Previously, engine design worked on a trial and error basis. Engineers would have to build and then physically test their concept, often destroying them in the process. Computer modeling streamlines the design phase, bringing improved engines that are both safe and efficient into production much more quickly. So we see the blade deforming. We see quite a lot of 
permanent change of shape, but it's predicting while there's a lot of damage to the blade, the blade itself has stayed intact. This sort of model is then used to study whether we can build a blade of that shape, which is safe. Every day in the USA, an average of 40 civil aviation bird strikes are reported. This data reveals that 97% occur during takeoff and landing. So managing birds at airports is vital. That's where the birds are, that's where the aircraft are at those low altitudes, and that's where we need to put our investment and energy. But no two airports are the same. Each offers a unique habitat to birds. This is Portland International Airport, and it's an attractive hunting ground for birds of prey. So the west end of the airfield has been a known hotspot for red-tailed hawks. So we identified the need to trap and translocate raptors out of that area. So we're heading that way to activate a trap. Hey, Nick. So I think this is a really good spot because we've had that unbanded adult over here hanging out on these towers and on here and kind of on the fence line. It might be a good opportunity to get that one person or that one hawk that's been sitting here for quite some time. So let me hand pulling this off and we'll get the doors facing the fence. All right, good. I got the lures. You want to grab the food and water? Yeah, I got it. After a series of strikes, the team identified the red-tailed hawk as a key species of concern. And every spring and fall, thousands of them pass overhead on the coastal migration path known as the Pacific Flyway. This being the largest grass habitat in the whole metropolitan area, birds are more likely to stop here. The river systems act as a corridor too, so birds can move up and down these river systems. So geographically, it's like a map that actually helps them locate and find uh, this particular site. And with 19 million passengers going through the airport each year, keeping birds out of the path of planes is crucial. During a typical migration season, the team capture up to 80 red-tailed hawks. For lures, we use their European starlings. We've also used pigeons in the past, but pigeons just tend to, to sit and not make a lot of movement, where if you put a few starlings in here, there's a lot of frantic movement. So the idea is you drive away, and the hungry hawk comes through, sees this activity down there, and looks at it. Oh, hey, that's a pretty easy meal. So they come down. Sometimes they'll go around the sides of the trap. Sometimes they might perch on the peaks or the, or the the doors here, but the idea is once they come down going for the birds, they hit this trigger stick or they perch on it, and then the trap closes, and now the, the hawk is trapped inside with loose netting, so it's not so stiff that they end up hurting themselves. All right, thanks, Nick. Thanks yep. for your help. I'll check it back in a couple hours. Sounds good. But relocating the birds is not enough. The team need to remove what is attracting them to the airfield. It's a food source that lives hidden out of sight. These are vole holes. He's uh, treating the airfield with a pelletized zinc phosphide. So the idea is to control the small mammal population, mainly the gray tail vole. We're trying to reduce that so we can reduce the overall attractant to the airfield. But every airport attracts different birds. 2,000 miles away, at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, their major challenge is pigeons. In the summer of 2014, they caused nine strikes, one involving over 50 birds. So, everybody, let's gather around a table. We are going to learn how to unzip birds. Gather around. Today, wildlife biologists from around the country have come to learn an investigative technique. Everybody gets a bird. Yep. One that can be used across various species. The morning dove, they eat much more fun things than pigeons do. Everybody's got a bird. Keep your hand on the outside. It is surgical sharp. Be super careful. And it's really easy peasy. 
Yeah. And it basically just comes it's so much nicer than a gizzard. Some of you will find seeds in yours other than the corn. These birds you can see are all eating different things. Nom, 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 nom. I can't tell what all that is. Once biologists know what their problem birds are eating, they can take steps to stop them coming. At DFW Airport, the team removed the plants that were attracting pigeons, and the number of strikes involving pigeons dropped immediately. Back at Portland, it's peak migration season, and the traps have been busy. We have five red-tailed hawks. They're all hatchiers. They're caught within the last two days. We're going to uh, band and wing tag these birds. Before relocation, the team collect vital data about the hawks. 366, uh, 25 zero. By building a picture of the age and condition of these birds, the team have a better chance of keeping them away from the airfield. So he's um, X over T. So he's still a kid. And this bird probably didn't grow up here. He's probably a migrant. So we're into the migration season. So he may have already come down from Canada. Or he may have moved up from California. Because um, these kids will move north and south initially. The younger birds are less likely to come back than older birds. We're going to do our best to take him to a more suitable site. Hopefully, he stays away from airfields. All of the hawks receive an easily visible wing tag. So for us, we're trying to track return rates and learn a little bit more, again, about these particular birds. And we do engage the public through a website. So there is opportunities for the public to submit locations if they see these birds. With the nice wing tags on them, they're easier to spot and identify. Uh, I want to get a nice front and back shot of the bird. Bird XT is now ready for relocation with the other captured hawks at a carefully chosen site. Awesome. Okay. It's thanks to programs like this that damaging bird strikes at American airports have been reduced significantly over the past 18 years. But the task is getting harder. Not only are there more planes in the air, there are more large birds, too. The major challenge we have with bird strikes today in North America is that we have seen a tremendous increase in the populations of most of our larger bird species. Several of the species have been very good at adapting to our human environment. And so things like Canada geese have been able to live among humans, take advantage of fertilized lawns in these industrial parks. They've moved um, to areas where they're able to survive um, throughout the winter and live there year round. So that's become a problem. The Smithsonian team proved that Canada geese caused flight US 1549 to land in the Hudson. But identifying the species was not enough. They needed to find out how many birds were involved. Knowing how many birds went into each engine may help the engineers in the future when they're designing aircraft engines to keep this in mind about flocking species. But the team faced a challenge the material was too degraded to identify individual DNA profiles. What they could do was work out if there was male or female DNA in each engine. So we decided just to try to determine the minimum number of birds in each engine by determining if there was at least one male and one female in the engine. To do this, the team carried out a process called DNA sexing. Just like humans, birds have two sex chromosomes. The genes are two different sizes. In this case, you're seeing two bands, two different sizes. So this individual is a female. And in this case, you're seeing only a single band, which means we have a male in this case. The team tested 20 samples from the engines. In the right engine, they found only male DNA. But in the left, they found both male and female. 
and that allows us to know that we had a minimum of three Canada geese that were ingested into the engines of that airplane. This was a crucial finding for the engine manufacturers. No aircraft engine on the planet can maintain thrust after a strike from multiple eight-pound birds. But for biologists, it was the beginning of a new mystery. Was this flock of geese a local population, or were they migratory? Why were those birds there? They hit those birds at 3,000 feet. That's pretty high. Not likely that birds very close to the airport would spiral their way up into the atmosphere to 3,000 feet and then get hit by an airplane. But January is not a time when Canada geese usually migrate. So what were these birds doing up so high at this time of the year? Um, it didn't seem right to us. The hunt for answers led the team to a complex technique that has never before been used in a bird strike case, one that searches for clues to a bird's history in its feathers. Birds, in particular Canada geese, they move to the north in order to breed. When they get to their breeding grounds, they're going to molt. That means they're gonna drop all of their feathers and they're gonna regrow their feathers in that location. Whatever an animal eats or drinks, in the case of the birds, is going to be incorporated into the feather. It's the adage, you are what you eat minus what you excrete. The process is called isotope analysis. This tiny piece of feather is then weighed and thermally decomposed, and the hydrogen within it converted to gas. The gas is then analyzed in a mass spectrometer, which should give clues to the bird's location. Areas further north in latitude have much lighter hydrogen. Areas further south have heavier hydrogens. The team tested Canada goose feathers from several locations to compare with those from Flight US 1549. Feathers from the resident New York geese weren't a good match. A much closer isotope signature was found in feathers from birds collected thousands of miles to the north in Canada. So we're pretty convinced that those geese that entered into those engines were a migrating population from the Canada region. It is most likely they were not part of the local uh, New York City resident population of geese. This revelation marked the end of the team's investigation. And what it reveals makes an already difficult problem even tougher. We need to start focusing now on migratory populations of large birds. Where are they? How can we predict them? How can we find them? Is there any tools that we can use that helps us locate these large flocks of migratory birds? Migratory geese are a little bit harder to manage and you have to manage them in different ways. Resident geese often stay in the local area. They'll only travel generally about three miles or so from the original site maybe where you first observed them or banded them. That's much easier to follow and track and monitor. Migratory geese may be at higher altitude and we don't know exactly when they're gonna migrate through. Once the full picture of the miracle on the Hudson emerged, experts began investigating ways to help planes and birds avoid each other. Departure Randolph, Suey one's rolling, D. In 2015, Joint Base San Antonio Randolph rolled out new technology in their control tower. When we have the full flight operations going, this is one of the busiest airfields in the United States. We watched bird activity as much as we would watch the weather. The base's biggest bird challenge is the 50,000 white-winged doves that nest in between the runways. So our biggest tool that we use to monitor the bird activity is uh, our bird detection system, our BDR bird detection radar. Currently right now, the way the system is set up is to uh, capture the mass or the size of a dove. So every triangle to see right here is an actual bird flying right now over our airfields. When we hit a certain level, like for example, this, this yellow line right here, it's about 600 birds in the area. 
we hit that, we're gonna start changing the way we operate. So as you can see, we have a T-38s right here taken off right now. Uh, you can see the first aircraft taken off and then shortly right behind him is uh, his wingman taking off following that. Normally, they'll take off together at the same time, right next to each other. However, right now, because of the increased bird threat that we have in the area, we're doing an uh, interval takeoff to help prevent them from being close to each other. They can focus on flying the plane, and if they have to dodge a bird, uh, they're able to do so without being right next to their wingman. And since implementing the bird radar and using that data to change our operations, we have seen a significant drop in bird strikes. Bird strikes of the white-winged dove were over half of our strikes. This year right now, so far, we only have about 5% of our bird strikes directly related to what the white winged dove. As well as carefully tracking and removing birds, scientists are also trying to figure out how to help them steer clear of planes. Birds are not suicidal. They want to avoid an aircraft but modern aircraft make it more difficult for them to do that than the older, noisier, slower aircraft did. Since the 1970s, lights have been used on planes in an attempt to counter this problem. But not all birds see in the same way, and using the wrong color light can actually attract certain species. An experiment run by Purdue University and the USDA approaches the issue from a totally new perspective, the birds themselves. So the way birds see is very different from the way humans see. Uh, and those differences are based on the fact that birds have four different types of visual pigments, while humans have only three different types of visual pigments. So what that means is birds can see more colors than we do, actually colors that humans cannot even imagine. The first species the team study is the brown-headed cowbird. They start by finding out which colors are most conspicuous to cowbirds by microscopically examining the bird's retinas. Then, they carry out a behavioral experiment. So what we do is we start the bird in here, we release the bird into this arena, and it's either gonna go left or right. And what we have is a single choice design, which is very good for testing for avoidance. Today, the team are testing red lights. They know it's a color that's highly visible to the cowbird. What they don't know is if the bird will avoid or be drawn to the light. Okay, so the bird is in position. Our camera here is recording the trial, and we're about to begin. So we just open the door and release the bird. Over the course of the experiment, the team run 20 trials for each color of light. Each of these trials involves 20 different cowbirds. In this trial, 13 birds avoid the red light. We're concluding that in this arena, where a bird is flushed through and has to make a rapid choice between two paths, that the bird chooses to stay away from sides that have red and blue lights. So one of the things I would like to do in the future is to replicate this experiment with species that have a high frequency of bird strikes or species that can cause damaging bird strikes. As we get more and more results, the idea is that we can talk to manufacturers in order to develop lights that could minimize the chances of collisions between uh, aircraft and birds. One of the purposes is, of course, to make the sky safer for humans, but at the same time, it could be a good thing for birds. The miracle on the Hudson could so easily have been a catastrophe. We really have to plan for the worst case scenario because we may not be so lucky the next time. 
in the future, our skies are only going to get busier, which means bird strikes will remain an ever-growing threat. Will we ever solve this 100%? The answer is probably no, but can we reduce it greatly? Yes. Even though we're flying more, and we know there are more large birds in the atmosphere, we've reduced the amount of damaging strikes. We've measured that, we know this for a fact. We are determined to help the people on the ground who are fighting this problem. We need to continue to identify the species of birds that are causing these problems. It's going to change in the future. We have to fight this for birds and for mankind.